Good afternoon, all. Uh, we are now in time to start the second session of the of the symposium of the workshop, which is nano safety assessment and life cycle assessment. And the first speaker of uh, of the day of this afternoon is going to be Thiro Salcines. Uh, Thiro is coordinator of the nano safety course and health and safety officer at the Universidad of Cantabria. He's also coordinator of, coordinator of the working group nanomaterials of health and safety group of the CRUE, sustainability on, of Spanish universities, and he has expertise on at nanomaterials in the cost action atmospheric electricity network. So today, uh, Thiro is going to present his uh, work and the work of uh, his team entitled Nanomaterials Exposure from Laboratory Air to Volcanic Ash. So if everything uh, if Steve is prepared, then you are the virtual floor. <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank to the organizing committee, especially to Neus, Maya Jose, to Jessica, the opportunity to be here. Today I'm going to talk about um, uh, two different uh, topics. Uh, one is about uh, nano safety, and the other one is about uh, 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 research that we did um, based on the nano safety work that we usually do. Uh, at the beginning, I am going to talk about uh, what the rules are telling us about nanotechnology and the nanomaterials. There is a discussion about uh, the mandatory about this topic. Later, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, I give a a few a short information about the intakes relationship with the nanotoxicology and what there is about the exposure limits. Later, we are going to, I'm going to talk about uh, occupational exposure, uh, some information about the life cycle of the nanomaterials and the hierarchy of control, and at the end about the research about electric charge of atmospheric nanoparticles and its potential implications with human health. <clears throat> One of the um, issues that I am interested to, to talk today is that um, usually we are talking about nanomaterials, nanoparticles um, indistinctly. Um, uh, even uh, it's very common to use ultrafine uh, particles. Um, the concepts are all of them the same, but um, it's important to know that uh, currently there is only one recommendation about the definition of nanomaterial, and it is coming from the European Union. It is um, from the 2011, and there is a revision that now they are trying to uh, have a more detailed definition. Mainly, what we have to pay attention is that we are talking about whatever kind of material between one and 100 nanometers with one of the three dimensions. When we uh, talk about the classification of nanomaterials, the nanomaterials with the three dimensions between one and 100 are what they are called nanoparticles eh? that they have uh, um, around the uh, shape. But uh, we usually use one expression or the other one, um, and it's common to use it. When um, the nanomaterials are starting to be used in the laboratories and in the research, there was um, some kind of um, warning. Um, there was a problem uh, if they were uh, included in the nano in the health and safety uh, laws, um, like it is a chemical and it is a possible uh, hazard for the uh, for the workers. It is included in the Spanish law about health and safety that it is from the 1995, and this law says that the workers have the right of an effective protection. And it is connected with the public administrations. So we are in the same position. And the, the points where we must start about 
health and safety and nanomaterials or nano safety is that we must make sure that we have this effective protection. Like nanomaterials is a chemical, we have another law where it says that um, the employer or the public administration should know from the beginning the hazardous chemicals at work. So what we should know if is if the nanomaterials um, is a hazardous chemicals or not. We'll know it in the next slide. But before, I want to point out that um, last week, uh, it was the first law where it appears uh, the nanomaterials included with uh, up updated a law about personal protective equipment. Last week, they start talking about some details, talking about chemicals, and the, there is a specific uh, writing the world of nanomaterials in several places of this law. So the nanomaterials are starting to appear to be in the laws and they are going to increase in the following time. Talking about if the nanomaterials are a hazardous chemical or not, um, we start uh, talking about uh, guidances of the European Commission that it was published in 2014. There it was writing that if the information available about uh, the characterization of a nano of a manufa manufactured nanomaterial is not enough, it's necessary to adopt a reasonable worst scenario approach. And it, it aims us directly to the precautionary principle. And this can be a, a potential solution. But this is very problematic because with, uh, if we have enough information, we can handle these hazards more or less acceptable. But if we don't have the, the, inf the correct information, and this happens frequently, um, our op the, 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 the solution is the precautionary principle. And this uh, drives to a huge uh, measure huge uh, engineering controls and very expensive. Ex very expensive. What we have done until now is that uh, knowing uh, with detail, uh, having a good characterization of the nanomaterials, we can know uh, uh, better its potential toxicology and we can adapt, we can do as the specific engineering controls, organization controls, or the specific PPEs for the risk that uh, it, can, it can appear. Um, another point of view that it is important to know is about the European Agency of Safety and Health that they published in 2018 that the manufactured nanomaterials have a greater health risk that's the same material in bulk material, okay? This is important to know because they are telling us that whatever kind of nanomaterial has more risk, that's the microsite of this material that we usually know or, or that we knew before. So um, it is telling us that uh, nanomaterials from the beginning, they are hazardous chemical and we must um, pay extra attention to them. The best way for having a correct information about this uh, chemical is to uh, have a, a well writing material safety data sheet. What usually happens is that, um, or, or at least is what uh, we find usually, is that uh, this kind of information, this safety data are not well completed. There are uh, general information mainly connected with the bold form, but um, there are no a good characterization. There is no specific information about the nano form. And they are so general that at the end, they are not giving us the information we need for working properly. So there should be and other options we have through 
CRUE, our health and safety group of the universities, we have uh, designed it a specific data sheet for nanomaterials. Um, it's available if it is needed. Here it is. Uh, this frame where that we designed it a uh, time ago um, is basic information that we need when there is no data. From the beginning is the main data of the nanomaterial and the processes that uh, the research or the laboratories are using them. It is in Spanish, but uh, there is no problem. At uh, this kind of frame of this kind of information should be uh, researched and between the health and safety officer. Um, like this is a flexible information, we can adapt and we can um, change or we can uh, take the information that uh, is, is here or an information that could be interesting. Talking about nanotechnology, uh, like whatever kind of uh, chemical, it's important to know that uh, the main intakes are inhalation as um, the main intake or most of the chemicals. Here it's important to know that um, there is information, there are modeling um, formulas for knowing how the nanoparticles go inside our respiratory tract. We'll talk about it later. And so we have um, enough information, in enough tools for, for knowing this with enough detail. Another <clears throat> intake is through the skin. There, at the beginning, there were papers that they were talking about that the um, uh, epidermis is enough for uh, avoid the nanomaterials we cross inside our organism, but uh, more is papers appear later um, telling us that the, the skin folds, for example, of the wrist of other parts of our skin, they can let the nanoparticles to cross and to go into our, our organism. So we need to have a PPE. Another uh, possible intake is the ingestion. This is easy to handle because having a good laboratory practice, we are going to avoid it. Something basic like not to eat, to drink, basic um, good manners that it is important. What um, we have, uh, I have put here uh, the Lee of our famous painter because it's important to know that uh, the, one of the behaviors specifically of nanomaterials is that they do translocation. What does it mean? It means that they are crossing the physical barriers and they can deposit in the different places of our organisms. For that, they use the circulatory system, the lymphatic system. Uh, one of the mm, first um, dis uh, discoveries that there were is that through the <clears throat> respiratory tract, our head airways, they were able to go directly to the brain. Eh? So it's very well known. But uh, this is uh, one of the particularly of nanomaterials we, we should know. When we are talking about uh, inhalation, that it is the main intake, and as I was talking before, we are able to to know, uh, we, we can estimate the, the position eh, on this side eh, of, the, of the respiratory tract, eh, the stratigraphic eh, or head weights. We can calculate to the tracheobronchial or we can estimate to the alveolar the position. Mm -hmm. How can we know um, the percentage of the position in these different risks? We can know it because it is known that uh, when the nanomaterials are smaller, between one or 100, mainly, or a little, a little bit more, they have a Brownian or diffusion deposition mm -hmm. when they are very small. Eh? When they are increasing the size, eh, these kind of mechanisms are disappearing little by little, and they are starting to happen a new mechanisms like sedimentation, impact 
protection impact tension or interception that there isn't here in this case. Um, there are more characteristics that it is important to know at the elastostatic uh, deposition. Um, this is one of the reasons due to we try it to do that research about electric charts and to know it's how it affects our with our health. <clears throat> Knowing this, um, it is important uh, knowing that we can uh, calculate this kind of deposition. The following step is to know which are the exposure limits and eh? the occupational exposure limits. In this case, it is not possible because there are no occupational exposure limits and no materials. But um, although it doesn't exist, uh, we can make uh, decisions that it can aim us to, to try to measure them in one a more, more or less uh, proper way. The first of them is to choose the working range. Um, uh, when we are talking about nanomaterials, uh, the definition uh, give between one or 100, okay? But what's happening is that uh, this is the size of the nanomaterials eh, near the source. But when they are spreading around the, the air and they are going to our breathing zone, the size of the nanomaterials is secondary nanomaterials. They are aggregating, they are, there is aggregation or agglomeration. It depends on the situations. The question is that they are arriving to our breathing zone to a big, with a bigger site. And we must um, have a detailed uh, information about this for knowing which range we are going to work. I'll tell there is an official exposure limit option that the other recommended exposure limits, RELS, where different countries, different companies are giving um, um, uh, this limit and we can take it and we can use it as a reference and this is what we usually do eh? we can we must choose what to do how to do it and we can compare with this recommended eh? other times when we don't have a recommended limit we can use for example the bulk eh, the official ones um, the european agency of health and safety were telling us that the nanomaterials have a greater risk if we recommended the exposure limit have the normal, the microsite official uh, exposure limit. And we can know that the limit of the nanomaterial site must be lower that, than this minimum. Eh? We must work with this carefully and we must have a good literature support for making these decisions, but uh, it is possible to do it always carefully and, and paying uh, attention and having a, a paper support. When there are no Spanish eh, uh, limits, other times it's possible to use the American limits that they are um, our, <clears throat> our more more important uh, exposure limits and we have different options when, uh, after knowing that we have this kind of limits um, our idea is to 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 measure it if we want to measure it from the beginning if we are reading the papers the literature we can uh, realize that um, there is a problem with the um, there is a problem because um, the more common toxicology effect connected with nanomaterials is the surface area. But um, the drawback is that there is no uh, common recommended, li recommended limit for surface area for nanomaterials. But we can't do anything in, until now, so maybe there'll be more in, or, or some of them in the future, but we, we can't, we can't uh, measure uh, with a recommended limitation. We can measure it, but not connected with a, a rail. Uh, the options that we have is that uh, um, uh, limits 
are taking common units like number concentration or mass. Eh? Mass is the most usual toxicology unit and it's, um, it's better for comparing it with the bulk form, but um, not always it's possible to have enough sample for having a characterization of the nanomaterial. Eh? Here, um, sometimes happens uh, uh, some curiosities, like for example, um, carbon uh, titanium dioxin. There is a, a recommended limit for nano nanomaterial, and there is an official uh, limit for microsite uh, uh, or bulk. So it is curious in this case. Talking about the exposure, uh, what we have to do is to identify the exposures. Um, it is it is um, something that uh, it's it's possible because uh, when it's necessary to use nanomaterials, um, we have it from the beginning. It is obvious, and um, what it is necessary is to have a safe by design in one way that uh, at the, from the beginning for the very first beginning we should have start having the the proper uh, engineering controls pps uh, according with our nanomaterial later is going to talk another colleague about this with detail and very well what uh, the researchers should do is to include the possible uh, the potential um, engineering controls or PPEs in the research proposals. Eh? This is something that little by little is happening. So it's better if we are, we are going to use nanomaterials and we need a correct cabinet, eh, biological cabinet, we include it in the proposal or a fume hood or whatever kind of uh, uh, control that it is necessary. Um, uh, it must be uh, under the European regulation. In this case, it's about machines that this is the Spanish uh, 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 option. If we have in this situation, uh, after knowing that there is a uh, occupational exposure, uh, what do we have to do? Do we have to measure the nanomaterials or can we work without doing this? The first, uh, uh, step is to know if there is this exposure. For that, we know we must the information of the uh, MSDS and uh, later to to evaluate the health hazards that we can find. Sometimes, like this, this uh, something difficult or is it is not easy to have the information available. And uh, the typical reaction is to say. This is not possible to do. I'm trying to have a short uh, um, uh, search. It is not possible to find uh, instruments or there are no official exposure limits. So some people decided not to make measurements. Um, it's better always to measure. Huh? There are instruments, there are options, although it is difficult and it takes time, but it is possible. Another option different to the measurements, the alternative is to use the qualitative risk assessment methods. But these kind of methods have a limitation. They mainly is to check the information and to, um, to have some easy um, uh, uh, risk activities for controlling them. Uh, but um, like many, many times, it is not possible to have a good information, the qualitative methods in this case, um, not always are uh, an option that give a, a good uh, safety result. Mm -hmm. Another option that, uh, that it is, uh, that there is for measuring is the NEAT, the nanoparticle emission assessment technique. It is easier to do, it's a semi-quantitative. We take um, a number concentration measurement and we take samples that later we can characterize with one T microscopy. So uh, there are instruments and tools available uh, 
um, that we know, we know. And later, what it is necessary is to do a data processing, uh, focus on about the activity that we are doing, but it's possible to do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, talking about the uh, life cycle of the nanomaterial, um, here depends on the activity of the laboratory. Uh, if we have a, a synthesis, for example, uh, in the laboratory, top down or bottom up, um, the reactions, uh, the reactor, when they are opening, opening it, when they are cleaning it, when they are scratching um, the, the, the material inside are uh, activities that they have a higher risk. Not, not uh, only the reaction that can be more controlled, sometimes the auxiliary activities have a higher risk, but it is necessary to know it with detail. The characterization is very important. Uh, we have found um, frequently that even uh, nanomaterials that they are coming from specific place, places that you suppose that they are arriving well, um, they are not giving the results that we were waiting. And later after uh, uh, um, another characterization in our own facilities, we realize is that the characteristics are not exactly what they, it was supposed they were. The purification is a, um, um, a step that it can be a, a dangerous too, mainly because they are using strong acids and chemicals. The functionalization um, is uh, one of the steps that can give um, um, good solutions. Uh, many times there is um, a core nanomaterial that it is uh, rapid with a, uh, one kind of corona eh? uh, with silica or another kind of composition and it gives a less toxicological effect or, or it can improve uh, specific properties. So this is a functionalization this is a very important step. Uh, we were talking at the beginning about nanomaterial of the first generation. Now, most of them are second generation because uh, these steps are giving um, new properties and, and new advances. And another option of using the nanomaterial is that we buy the nanomaterial, we bring the material, the nanomaterial like a product, but we add it in our uh, processes we did in our uh, practices. So we don't uh, synthesize it, but we use it anyway. So um, this is another step that it is common to use it. Talking about the um, hierarchy of control, uh, it is the same that whatever kind of chemical, uh, the elimination, eh? it's obvious that we are not going to eliminate it because we are using it a purpose. We are looking for the specific uh, chemical, physic, physic chemical properties of the nanomaterials, but the substitu substitu substitution sometimes is an option. For example, changing the structure of the nanomaterial can reduce the toxicology effect, and we can have a very similar uh, result. And um, for example, about uh, titanium, uh, titanium uh, dioxin is one option, eh? or changing the site. Eh? We can have uh, in one range of sites the same effect, eh? having a bigger site. So uh, sometimes there are probabilities. Um, currently, most of the nanomaterials are in this, in this step. Why? Because at the beginning, most of them were like powder, eh? fine uh, powder, and now there are many of them that they are in a liquid. No, it is a substitution, and eh? we can handle it with more safety conditions. In general controls, we are going to see now some of the uh, options that there are. Administrative controls: How can it be possible that whatever person is using nanomaterials without knowing? With detail, uh, that they don't have information, they don't have training, this is not possible. And the last option is the PPEs, of course. Talking about the different devices of box that we know, 
a few words, yeah, it's possible, yeah, biological safety cabinet. Mm? This is one of the safety cabinets we have uh, in our activities. Another option is a nano chamber, is an, another version of fume hoods that it has a low, um, a low speed and it gives uh, extra uh, safety conditions. When we are we're using with a small amount, we can use handling disclosures and even with a good a safety way of changing the filter. And here we have one of that we have, so it is possible to have it. Yeah. Um, only talking about the PPEs, this is one paper that pub, uh, published one of the colleges about the criteria of selection of PPEs uh, with nanomaterials. Mainly the result is that only the highest level of the uh, PPEs is, where, is the, the category that we can use with nanomaterials eh, because the filtration is higher. The other option that we have, uh, <clears throat> respirator, half, full, which is another option when the uh, exposure is higher to protect the, the, the body with clothes, always with fabric, never with natural uh, compositions, um, the eyes, the shoes, and the top ball glove is very important. It's important uh, um, even the connection of the glove with the laboratory, with the laboratory coat eh, or the coverall. Eh, it's important that this is connected eh, and not uh, to see the skin of the research. Uh, 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 don't see the skin. Mm -hmm. Types of gloves, mm, there are different kind of compositions that they are working very well with nanomaterials and it depends main, mainly about the chemicals that they are using too. We use, for example, safety signs like this, that this is before uh, stickers, this was after. So mm, it helps to control this kind uh, uh, of paying attention or even when they are sending the, the nanomaterial samples between the laboratories. Eh? And this is enough about health and safety. Now I uh, have time for talking about, uh, shortly about uh, uh, electric charts of atmospheric nanoparticles and its potential implications with human health. Mainly our idea was um, to, um, <clears throat> to measure all these sites eh, with eh, of the graph of the respiratory tract of the human health. Eh? Um, as we were measuring from six to 10,000 nanometers, we were focused on from six to 38. This is the site eh, that we were focused on this research because mainly this is the brownian behavior of the nanomaterials in the, in the end of our respiratory tract. Here is the, the position with these different sites in hair, head airways, tracheobronchial and alveolar. We can see that the alveolar has a more deposition also in the smaller sites with six nanometers, they have a regular deposition. No? Later, um, one of the cross of information we did is that uh, having the, the position fraction here, that it is the formula, and with the surface area that we were measuring with our device, LP device, electric, <coughs> uh, electric uh, uh, impactor. And this is the measurement that we had at the, from the beginning. We could think that there is more deposition in our respiratory respiratory tract around this site, but crossing the two information, we found that there is a high plateau from six to 150 sites uh, where it is the most important deposition in our respiratory tract, the respiratory tract, talking in general. But if we talk about the different regions, we see that there is a more deposition of alveolar in 30, 54, 94 and 150. Mm -hmm. This is the most uh, 
the highest deposition, in this case with alveolar, no? but we are talking about head airways, the highest deposition in this case was uh, near six nanometers. And this was the uh, electric charge uh, measurements eh? that we do it in Fento Amperios, uh, Fento, Fento Columbios, sorry. Um, uh, what it was very um, challenging is that um, we, we were able to find that there was, there was a, a predominant negative measurements in the one uh, decreasing to two, three and later disappearing. So it's more connected with the small nanoparticles we were measuring. And crossing the characterization, this is one of the samples of nano, nanometers. And here we have the uh, one graphite eh, carbon and this is multi wallet nanoparticles. Uh, and we do a contrast characterization with the 10 microcosby and with the Raman. And with the two of them, we were able to contrast the, these uh, conclusions. And this is about uh, iron oxidase eh, that we can see the, the shape and the, we have the same contrast information with the Raman. And this is- Two, is, two uh, minutes left. Of, sorry, yes. And this is, this is the last um, uh, information that we found that it is the chart was mainly negative sides. And this is what the, the one of the discoveries of this research. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and I am ready for whatever kind of uh, question. Any question from the audience? I have a I have a question, Ciro, on on this uh, nice and beautiful talk that mm -hmm. you did, and indeed very instructive for all of us that we are working with nanoparticle and we are uh, managing and dealing with uh, this kind of sample. So I have a question, and and it is uh, is there is it important to understand the evolution of the particle in the media in which they are exposed? I mean. Uh, you address the problem of the size, the problem of the shape, and the problem of the asynthesis, the synthesis protocol, and the characterization. But I am wondering that if the particles, they may evolve because they may aggregate or they may dissolve, I guess that this is important also to tune and uh, to understand the biological behavior and therefore the safety of the particle. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one of the... Um... Um, uh, topics that we don't know well is uh, which are the reason of the aggregations of the nanoparticles before our before we brief it. Um, uh, the electric uh, charts uh, um, uh, is one of the characteristics that we we must know uh, for for trying to know that kind of of behavior. And there is a um, uh, bibliography that they say that the negative chart have a, have a good, uh, a good uh, wealth uh, feeling for people. Eh? For example, near the maritime uh, climate or near the rivers, there are mainly negative charts and it is strong connected with a well, well-being. So um, it, is, it is one important uh, information. Thank you very much, Ciro. I think that Maria Jose wants to ask something. Uh, thank you, Ciro, for the, for the talk. I would like to ask you uh, um, if you can detail a little bit uh, uh, this uh, methodology for risk assessment uh, uh, that is the control uh, banding nanotool in which consists? Uh, control banding nanotool specifically? Yes. Yes, control banding is a um, uh, uh, is a qualitative method that mainly they are is asking uh, easy information about the characteristics of the nanomaterials and the processes, and crossing that information is easy to find um, uh, engineering methods or um, uh, some kind of. Um, strategies for reducing the the risk of the of the nanomaterials it is one way of 
manage them uh, easily. But the lack or the drawback is that you, I, I have done it many times and uh, until I realized it that I never had enough information for doing that well. So when they are asking me, do you have this, that, the shape, the color, blah? No, 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 no. There is one option that it is not available. Um, I finished all of our information, so I am doing nothing. Eh? Oh, it's one option if we have good information, but um, we always uh, support to, to measure the exposure because the specific situation of the laboratories uh, is important to know. Okay. Thank you very much, Ciro. And if there is no more questions in the audience, then let's thank the speaker again, please. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.